<clears throat> Namaste and good morning, everyone. Let's start our Saturday class with some prayers first. Om Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devo, Maheshwara, Guru Sakshat, Parbrahma, Tasmai Shri, Guru Venamaha, Om Bhur Bhoswaha, Tatsavitra Varenayam, Bhargo Devasedhi Mahi, Diyo Yonaha Prachodayat, Astoma Sadgamya, Tamsoma Jyotir Gamya, Mrityurma Amritam Gamya, Om Sahnavavatu, Sahnavunaktu, Sahviryam Karvavai, Tejasvi Navadhi Tamastu, Mavidvishavai, Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Let's open our books, Yoga Sutras. And we are on the third chapter, Vibhuti Pad. So after going through that uh, sadhana, or even before the sadhana, understanding what this life is all about, what are we supposed to attain? And when we are going through these deeper sadhanas, we will see certain powers. Powers are called virputis. It's almost like somebody who eats well, takes care of the body, exercises, Sure, body will be strong. It will be healthy. And body is just uh, supposed to, it's like a temporary casing which we all have. Over here, Rishi Patanjali is talking about sadhana of the mind. Mind which has been uh, with us, the soul, for countless lifetimes. It's very powerful. It has encased the Atma. You can imagine how powerful it is. So that's why the sadhana about the mind is talking about. And when we do this sadhana, what really happens? Of course, powers come. Okay, so these are some of the things which is talking about. Sure, it fascinates us. You just love reading about it. But very important thing to remember that this practice, uh, which sounds very thrilling, has not much spiritual value. Okay, remember that. To be able to read somebody's mind, to be able to know the past or the future, for a yogi, doesn't have much value. So we don't do a yoga sadhana to get these powers. Rishi Patanjali mentions that these practices to show us that this will happen. But we got to remember that your mind has the limitless power but Atma, the soul, who we are, has not worked. That's what we are. We got to have this mind under our control. Not the other way around. Keep that in mind. So we're going to just go through some of these today. Let's look at verse number 19. Because in the previous verse, we learned that we can have the knowledge of our sanskars which are embedded in our chit. We can know our past lives, where we came from, what did we do? We can know that. But now in this verse, he's talking about knowing the other person's mind too. Pratasya se parachit gyanam. Pratasya. See, pratya means the thought in the mind or the content of the mind. So, pratyasya means of the content of the mind. 
So it's like a cognition. Sometimes we use that word. Par means another, somebody else. Chit means the deeper layers of the mind. Jnanam means knowledge. So by performing sanyam on the pratyas, knowledge of another's mind arises. So where are you doing the sanyam? And the result comes like this. So as I said earlier, <clears throat> That in the previous sutra, Patanjali explains that knowledge of our previous life comes from the direct realization of our sanskars. And over here, he's telling us that realization of another person's cognition also opens the door <clears throat> to understanding the other person's mind. So the practice can reach to that level. This kind of a practice requires sir, understanding how our mind functions, sir, the faculties of our mind. Our mind has emotions and the intellect also, which influences our consciousness and impels us to take the actions. So that means our emotions got to be fully controlled. Our intellect has to be that higher level. Because if the intellect is colored, then we'll definitely have a distorted understanding. Because there are continuous emotional tides. They even affect our body. Through the body, we express those feelings. Sometimes through different movements, sometimes through different gestures. For example, the facial expressions, changes with the tone of voice, breathing pattern, posture, muscular tension, or even the expressions in our eyes. So it's a pretty complicated inner world we live with. So that's why when we should not play with this through Sanyam, this powerful housing which we have. And sometimes these outer intellectual expressions are not even accurate indicators of our inner climate. Even we get confused. Then how can we read somebody else's mind? So this practice which he is talking about, the sanyam on the cognitions of the other person's mind begins with the differentiating a person's emotional current from their intellectual expressions. First your own, then the others. But there has to be good reason for it. Because in addition to a highly concentrated mind, we need a mind that has absorbed with the virtues. You remember in the first chapter, verse number 33, he talked about the virtues. Four virtues, which are very important for a sadhak. Maitri, Karuna, Mudita, Upeksha. Friendliness. Cheerfulness. Compassion, like a non-judgment. You remember that? So friendship, compassion, cheerfulness, and non-judgment. We talked about all these in detail. So a yogi of this caliber, who sees these powers, has these virtues in his mind. Those are mental virtues. This friendliness does not mean that you are just attending every party you have been invited to. Friendliness is an inner feeling of that we are all one. These virtues help remove the wall of duality between us and the one whose feelings we are trying to sense. 
That's the only way we can feel the oneness. By using that person's feelings as a pathway, we allow our highly concentrated mind to enter his dom emotional domain. These feelings are the pathway to a large pool of similar emotions. So by observing the subtle variations in the feelings and their trigger points, we are able to comprehend the general characteristics of the emotional pool and its magnitude. That is known by Parchit Pratyasya. I mean, you can imagine that you got to be completely calm. You got to understand who you are. And you got to know that there has to be a reason to know what is in the other person's mind. The motive has to be pure too. If the motive is not right, you are not coming from the right place. Sure, therapists, psychiatrists, psychologists, they do this. If the motive is pure, sure, they can help. But if the motive is the business angle, financial angle, then it doesn't work this way. The saints of India, I'm talking about the long time when these scriptures were written. When there was more peace, more feeling of oneness. Even the kings used to go to the gurus in the ashram. And those gurus could tell what is happening right now in your life. What is the reason? And how to solve this. And those kings, they listen to the guru. You remember King Dashrath, he went to his guru, Rishi Vashisht. He said, I am so disturbed. What should I do? Later on, his son Ram, when he became a king, he went to his guru also. He said, I cannot sleep at night. What should I do? Those gurus, through this, these vibhutis, because there was a reason for those gurus to know their minds, their disciples' mind, to help them, to guide them. There was no fees attached, no condition attached. So when we read or study something like this, we got to take our mind to that kind of a purity. Entire range of minds, attributes fall into three categories, actually. Past, present, and future. All of that is over there. Our sanskars, they lie dormant deep in the mind field. They belong to the past. And sanskars rising to the surface belong to the present. And they are experienced as cognitions. Mind also has the ability to comprehend the sanskars, which will manifest in the future. Mind is the locus of all these attributes past, present, and future. That's why those rishis, they were called Trikal Darshi. Trikal. Three means three, call means time. Darshi means seers. They could see very clearly the past, present, and future. We know that Ramayana, <clears throat> written by Valmiki Ji, when he was writing, he wrote about the present, but he wrote about the past also. He could see the past as clearly as we can see the present right now, or even more clearly. And then he wrote about the future also. 
past, present and future. So cognitions, particularly those that have an emotional faculty as their source, are just the tip of the iceberg. By comprehending them, practicing sanyam on them, we can allow our mind to have a high degree of absorption in that person's feelings. So that means we should not have attachment to that person. No personal motive. But we got to feel it, understand it, if we want to help that person. <sighs> but remember, this gives us only limited access to that pool. We cannot say that I know it all now. Even when we talk to somebody, no matter how close the person is, we can never claim that we know everything. The same way, even a yogi who is doing the sanyam on somebody else's cognitions, mind is a vast pool. You will not know everything. So do not claim that. That's why Rishi Patanjali clarifies this in the next sutra. These sutras are very deep, by the way. Just by looking at them, we really don't understand completely, but Try to understand a little bit and reflect upon them a little more in your own sadhana. Let's look at one more. Verse number 20. Na cha tat alam sa alambanam tasse a vishay bhut tuat. Na means not. Cha means and. Or however, that means that sa alambanam. Sa alamban means with a support or accompanied by some object. Alamban, that is a support. Tasse of that a vishay bhut tvad. Because of not being the subject of sayyama. So he says the knowledge, however, does not include the object of cognition. Because that object is not in the domain of saying. So what he's saying that what the knowledge of that, the others mental factors is not gained with the support of the mental image. Because that is not the object of the same. Knowledge of other person's mind gained through Sanyam does not include the mental image of that mind. Because it is just like a general nature. You do Sanyam on somebody's mind, it's a general nature. There are different contents in the mind. Which are not the object of the Sanyam. If you are aware of a particular image or a pratye which are pervading in somebody's mind, sure you can have the knowledge of that mind. But thoughts can be read generally only. Okay, so that means do not think that you know it all. We are not to serve with only God is. Even sometimes we don't even know what is going on in our own mind. We don't have a clarity. How can we know somebody else's mind? It is so deep. You cannot know any particular thought in that mind. Only the nature of the thought can be known. So that's why the supratye is of a general nature. General nature means it could be, yeah, this person hates this thing or likes this thing. So like a rag, dvesh, etc. Sure, you can have an idea of that. You can understand the person is greedy. There are two stages. In first stage, there is a general thought reading. 
In the second stage, there could be a particular thought reading. When we look at a particular thought, through senyam over his mind, we know in a general way which vritti, such as hate, anger, love, passion, fear, anxiety, arising from his mind. It's like a very general. And it can be done through the help of pratyaya. Not through reading the face. Face reading can be altogether different than what the cognition or the thoughts are in the person's mind. So pratye can be understood through dhyan or through dreams or through observation or behavior. So these are the other methods of understanding other person's mind. So for understanding another person's mind, you have to give him some negative suggestions, understand his response. This is what the psychologists do. And after you have been able to do senyam on his response, you know the general nature of his mind. That's how all these different tests, they have come out. But in the second stage, you have to start with particular thought working in his mind. You got to give the person few symbols. Ask him to work with them. And that's how a person can create a connection between the mind, his mind and your mind. Because you are working with your mind also. So disciples' mind and your mind. And every particular thought or reaction can be directly seen through sanyam. So then after that you do the sanyam. So it's not just a something casually you look at. This is a very deep study. So it is said in the sutra that particular thoughts in the mind of another person cannot be read or seen. That's what Patanjali, Rishi Patanjali is saying. That is the first stage we have described. It is very difficult, requires a very special capacity of the mind. And I'm sure you will all agree with that. And there has to be a good reason to do all this. Because cognitions rather than the sanskars are the object of sanyam. And cognition happens in the present. And as they arise, they color our consciousness. Mind registers them as feelings. So cognitions are associated with their corresponding objects. But the mind's association with objects lasts only for a moment. Okay, so that's why it just uh, don't play with it casually, especially the other person's mind. You can help them, but don't think that you know it all. So it's almost like a warning he's giving it to us. The yogi is, by definition, they have a highly trained mind. Not only trained, disciplined mind, concentrated mind. They can definitely successfully concentrate on somebody else's cognitions as well as their own. And you can meditate or these yogis can meditate others' cognitions because they have mastered the art of remaining untouched by what they touch. Do you remember for a yogi of this caliber, the highest level of dispassion is needed. Par vairagya. You remember the two things, vairagya and abhyas? And then vairagya or the dispassion, it could be lower, it could be higher. So yogis of this caliber has to have a par vairagya. They can use this ability to identify a particular cognition 
or a group of cognitions from the immediate past and use it as an object of the practice of Sanya. A yogi of this caliber can also use this ability to identify his own cognition or group of cognitions belonging to his more distant past and use it as an object of Sanya. Let's look at next verse. <clears throat> Kayaha Rupa Sanyamat Tad Grahe Shakti Satambe Chakshu Parkash Asampar Yoga Antar Dhyanam. So this is another Vibhuti. Kaya, body. So this Vibhuti is about invisibility. Yesterday we were reading from the book uh, Autobiography of Yogananda. And we saw, we read about that how a yogi of this caliber can disappear. This can happen. So over here, Rishi Patanjali is talking about Kaya means body, Rup means form, Sanyamat by doing Sanyam. Tad means that Grahe means receptive. Shakti means power. Satambhe, suspension. Chakshu, the eye. Prakash, light. Asamparyoge, absence of contact. Antardhyanam, being invisible. So by performing sanyam on the form of the body, and suspending receptivity of the form. There being no contact between the eye and the light, the yogi can become invisible. So yogi can perform on his own body. Then suddenly the power of receiving the form stops and there is no contact between the eyes of observers and the body of the yogi. He becomes invisible. And this is a well-known siddhi or psychic power. For an ordinary person, sure, it's a frightening practice. When a form dissolves, before a person's eyes, it is as frightening as the coming of death. Here was the person, now it's gone. At least when somebody dies, we can see that form is there. Only the form is not moving and talking to us. But over here, even the form disappears. You can imagine, imagine how frightening it would be for ordinary people like us. An object becomes visible when the light rays reflected from its surface and the eye of an observer. Okay, so that's why this eyes, the power to see and the light, they are seen together. If the light is stopped by the power of Sanyam, then one can become invisible. We all know that there are five tanmatras or the subtle forms of elements. See, all five of, uh, elemental forces, they have the subtlety to them, which is called tanmatra. Rup tanmatra becomes the object of the yogi's sanyam in this one. Rup. First, the yogi practices sanyam on his body with a mirror. Then the suspension of the power of receiving a roof or form. For some time, there is no contact between the observer and the body of the yogi. You can stand in front of the mirror. Keep looking at your eyes. Keep looking at your eyes. Look deep within your eyes. 
Practice it. Tell me what do you feel? What really happens to you? But make sure you don't look around. You don't look at your nose and your hair and your ears and your skin. Because sometimes we get distracted by all that or something else in the mirror or some sound. No. You got to completely only one thing. Practice it. But not if it hurts you. It should feel pleasant. It should bring peacefulness in you. Not agitation. You can do sitting down. Yeah? But make sure you are still. The object, that mirror you are looking at is still. And you just fully concentrate. Only in the eyes. So the physical body first becomes invisible to the yogi himself actually. And afterwards through practice it becomes invisible to others. Because there is no connection between the object and the observer. So this involves meditation on the physical form as seen in the mirror. But think about it. <clears throat> what does Patanjali mean by the power of percep perceivability? How do we perceive our body? The form of the body. So is this perceivability of the form of the body different from the perceivability of the body itself? There are a lot of questions go through mind when we read something like this. Is Patanjali talking about just erecting a wall? Or drawing a curtain between the viewer and the yogi? Like other people cannot see the yogi? Is it just a magic? Is he referring to the power intrinsic to the sense of a sight only? Is he talking about some special yogic technique for blocking the sense of sight or suppressing the other person's mental capacity? We got to understand what the intention of these vibhutis are. When we understand this primordial prakriti, okay, primordial prakriti. See, right now we see the manifest prakriti, but then there is a unmanifest prakriti because prakriti never and see that just like a God doesn't end, God is eternal, Prakriti is eternal too. It is very powerful. And this power to see is Prakriti's power. The only difference between the Prakriti and the God is God never changes. There's no change in God. Prakriti changes. This body which is made out of Prakriti keeps on changing. But I never change. This I was the same when I was a baby. I is the same when I'm at this old age now. And in between also, I doesn't change. This I stays the same even then uh, this body disintegrates with sickness or with the accident or uh, natural. I doesn't change. So primordial prakriti we need to understand. It is actually primordial prakriti is uh, imperceptible. So that's why unmanifest prakriti we cannot understand because we are trying to understand through the mind. 
pure pervasive intelligence uh, with the awareness of subjectivity and objectivity is the first step to understand this. And this prakriti at this level is called mahat. Mahat means the grand. And from the standpoint of its intrinsic subject object awareness, you can call it a buddhi also. The knowing power. This is the first traceable stage of untraceable prakriti. Because we need some kind of a tool to understand which we cannot understand otherwise. So God has given us this tool. Buddhi is the locus of our intelligence. That's why this Buddhi embodies Grahak Shakti. Shakti means the power. Grahak Shakti means the power to perceive. Buddhi has that. It has the Grahe Shakti, the power to be perceived. So power to perceive and power to be perceived. And it has a grahan shakti. The power to carry out the process of perception. This is such a great instrument God has given it to us. Which we don't pay much attention. In our day to day life. When do we really go deeper into this subtle part of our personality, which is called buddhi? So these three powers, which I told you, together is called a buddhi sattva. Buddhi sattva means essence of the buddhi. Buddhi means intellect. Buddhi alone has the capacity to comprehend the infinitely vast scope of its essence. The faculties of thought, identification, discrimination, the experiences of sound, touch, form, taste, smell, the senses of cognition, the senses of actions, the world made of power, matter, the energy, all evolve from buddhi actually. It is so powerful. Buddhi knows itself and its essence. It knows it is the perceiver, the object of perception, process of perception. Buddhi also knows everything that evolves from it. So all the evolutes of buddhi are imbued with its threefold essence. The power to perceive, power to be perceived, and the power to carry out the process of perception. Yet one of these powers is always more dominant than the other. For example, the mind, the thinking faculty, has the capacity to know everything in the objective world, but can know itself only with the aid of buddhi. So when they are together, only then it will know. Or ahankar. Ahankar is the faculty of identification. Ahankar is like a, right now I can identify myself as a speaker or a teacher has the capacity to identify anything in the objective world, but can identify itself only with the aid of the buddhi. That's how important the buddhi is. Buddhi is the one which says, I am this right now. In this particular situation, I am the teacher. In a different situation, I could be a student. Who tells me that? The buddhi in me tells me that. In this regard, the power to perceive inherent in the faculty of thinking and identification is subdued while the power to be perceived is fully manifest. 
there's a little bit more about this verse I want to go through, but we'll do it next week. Let's stop it here because time to end this class. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachate Purnase Purnamadai Purnameva Visheshate Om Shanti 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 Om. Thank you very much for coming.